Good morning, members, and welcome to this meeting with the Planning Applications Committee for the 29th of June. This meeting has been live streamed and will be made available on the Council web website for public viewing. Remote participants, please follow the good practice guidance, which includes muting microphones and switching off your video when you're not addressing the meeting, writing speak in Teams chat function when you want to contribute. If you're in the hall, you can do this on your iPhone or iPad. Please don't repeat contributions already made by other members. No material should be posted in the chat function if it is intended as part of the discussion. The usual standing orders apply, including that any votes be undertaken by roll call. If any member has to leave the meeting, please either leave the Teams meeting for that period of time or write leave in the Teams chat function and then join when you rejoin the meeting so that we can keep track on whether the meeting is quoted. All members should speak clearly and directly into the microphone when making contributions or when referring to reports. Please provide reference to the relevant page and paragraph to allow everyone to follow. Please focus contributions to areas where clarification is required or to propose an alternative to a recommendation. The usual standing orders apply, including any votes will be undertaken by roll call. Uh, Tracy, can you confirm sedent and apologies, please? And I confirm my approval of the remote participation by the members listed. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, members. We've got 16 members present in total, nine members present in the Council HQ, being the Chair, Councillor Beretti, Councillor John Campbell, Councillor Dennerley, Councillor Driver, Councillor Howey, Councillor Hislop, Councillor Thompson and Councillor Wood. And nine members present on teams being the Vice Chair, Councillor Blake, Councillor Dashper, Councillor Justy, Councillor Hill, Councillor Marshall and Councillor Walters. I've got three apologies from Councillor Drysdale, McFarlane and Slater. And two members not present at the start of the meeting as Councillor Brodie and Councillor Ian Crothers. Thank you, Tracy. Are there any declarations of interest, members? Yes, Chairman, I have, I have one. It's item five. One of the representatives is a former colleague and friend, although I haven't seen him since pre-COVID and certainly have had no discussion on this item, uh, so I don't see any point, any point in leaving the meeting. I will remain. Thanks very much, Councillor Blake. Any other declarations of interest? In that case, Tracy, can you outline the procedure to be followed to the meeting today, please? Thanks, Chair. The Planning Applications Committee will consider each application in turn as detailed on the agenda. The case officer or other appointed officer will make a short presentation addressing the determining issues accompanied by digital images. Any late information, amendments or corrections will be reported at this time. Members may ask questions of officers following the presentation on points of clarification. The Chairman has been provided with a list of eligible representatives who have registered to speak at this meeting within the period specified in Council policy. No other persons will be allowed to speak. The Chairman will individually invite those who have registered in advance to speak to make their presentation, after which they may be questioned by committee members. No questions may be asked of members. The order of eligible parties being heard will be as follows. Third parties objecting to an application. Third parties supporting an application. Statutory consultees objecting to an application. Elected members of Dumfries and Galloway Council who are not members of the Planning Applications Committee and such members should withdraw from the meeting after making their presentation and applicants or their agents. Representers were offered the option of attending today's meeting in person, joining remotely via Microsoft Teams, or to provide a written statement to be read out on their behalf. And a copy of the public speaking list is available from the committee officer taking notes of our proceedings. And this has been uploaded to the Teams chat. Presentations will be strictly limited to three minutes per person, except for national and major developments, which by their very nature are more complex and the time limit will be five minutes. The chairman of the committee will ask you to come to a conclusion if you take too long. Representers are encouraged to use the time allotted to clarify any points they consider material and address the determining issues. 
Certain matters are not normally material planning considerations and will not be taken into account by the Council when deciding on a planning application. Representatives should not raise any new matters without explaining why they were not raised earlier with the case officer. Please do not repeat what is in the report, as members will have already read the report. After all the representations have been heard, the meeting is then in formal session, and no members of the public may address the committee from the public gallery. The Planning Applications Committee will then proceed to determine the application. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, Tracy. We go on to the next agenda item, which is the minute of the previous meeting, 9th of June 2022, for noting this was approved at full council yesterday. Agenda. So happy to note. Thank you. Agenda item number four, delegation to planning application committee report by head of governance and insurance, page 17 and 18. Members are asked to note the remit of the planning applications committee is detailed in 3.2. Are members happy to note? Councillor Campbell. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, I'm happy to note the remit. I'm just wondering uh, why it wasn't brought to the 9th of June committee, because that technically would have been the first committee on planning matters. David, do you know? If no, we'll find out and get back to you, Councillor Campbell. Uh, sorry, Chair, it wasn't uh, a planning issue. Sorry, apologies. sorry, Chair. Yeah, that's a governance issue, but um, it missed off the first agenda, so it was brought to the next available meeting. Yeah, happy to go to the recommendations, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Campbell. Councillor Hislop. Chair, it's just under 510.4. Is that not an operational matter rather than something that should be delegated to us? You know, that's something that we actually do rather, you know, just that we, it's only the members that are present. Delegation something that's given to you, I would have said that was more an operational matter. I would agree it's a procedural matter. It just probably sets out whatever the parameters are. Tracy? Chair, it just, um, that's part of our scheme uh, of administration delegation to committees um, that that's stated within the planning committee. So that's why it's part of the delegation. Happy with that, Ivor? Any other matters? If not, we will note the delegation is set out in the papers and move on to agenda item number five. Number five is an, an, an application for the erection of 60 bedroom residential care home, class eight, and formation of vehicular access, footpaths, car parking and landscaping, including erection of a 1.8 metre high mesh fencing along part of the southern boundary at land between Dobiti Road and Park Road, Dumfries. The application types full application, reference numbers 21 stroke 1820 stroke full. The recommendation is to refuse and the case officer is Lindsay Cameron. I believe, uh, oh, I note Tracy, Councillor Curlis has now joined us. I believe Lindsay's on Teams. So Lindsay, if you're ready, join us and take us through your presentation, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Could I have the first slide, please? This is the location plan. Um, it shows the application site, which is a, a wedge-shaped area of relatively flat agricultural grazing land, which is located between Dobiti Road to the north and Park Road to the south, as you approach into Dumfries from the west. Next slide, please. This second slide shows an extract from the Dumfries Inset map in LDP2, showing the application site uh, roughly in the, the middle of the slide. Um, it shows it in the context of the Dumfries settlement. As you can see, it's located on the edge of the main built-up area of the town between it and Cargambridge to the southwest. Next slide, please. Um, this next slide is a constraints plan showing the extent of the Curry Stains Cursus scheduled monument which is in the same field and immediately to the south of the application site, and also the large triangular area to the south of Park Road. Um, this uh, plan also shows the wider area of archaeological interest, which occupies at least part of the application site. Next slide, please. Um, as you will see when we move on to the photos, um, there's a row of 10 mature trees along the Dobiti Road boundary of the site. 
and a tree in a mature hedge, the park road boundary. Um, these make a significant contribution to the character and amenity of the area and approach into Dumfries from the west. Um, and therefore, um, a tree constraints plan and tree survey were requested as part of the supporting information for this application. Um, next slide, please. Moving on to the development proposal itself, um, here we have the proposed block plan showing the proposed care home fronting onto Dalbisi Road um, with vehicular access from Park Road. Next slide, please. Uh, the next slide shows the proposed ground floor plan for the building. Next slide. And this is the proposed first floor plan. Um, in general terms, the ground and first floor floor plans have a similar layout in terms of bedrooms, communal and staff areas. Next slide, please. Moving on, we have the proposal landscaping plan, uh, which includes secure garden areas for residents enclosed by fencing off each elevation um, and also new hard and soft landscaping within the wider site. Next slide, please. This slide shows the proposed elevations for the proposed care home, uh, with the top left elevation being that which would face towards 47 Dobiti Road. Um, and the elevation in the, the middle of this slide uh, showing that which would front on to Dobiti Road. This elevation shows the full length of the building, which would extend to approximately 80 metres. Uh, the elevation at the bottom of the slide shows the building at its widest point, which would be approximately 51.5 metres. Next slide, please. Uh, the following slide shows the elevations as seen from the southwest. That's the, the, the elevation on the, the top, and also as it would be viewed from Park Road. Uh, next slide, please. Moving on, this slide shows the proposed care home building in relation to the surrounding dwellings on both Dalbisi Road and Park Road. Um, for comparison, uh, the dwellings at 45 and 47 Dalbisi Road is seen in the the extreme top left of the slide extends to a height of about 5.5 metres, while the proposed care home would be 11 metres in height at its highest point. Uh, the third image from the top shows the care home in relation to the properties uh, to the north side of Dubbiti Road, um, as well as 14 Park Road, which is to the right hand side of the slide. Um, and 14 Park Road extends to about 8 metres in height, approximately. Next slide, please. Uh, next, we move on to the photographs. This first photo was taken as you approach the site along Dalbiti Road as you're leaving Dumfries. The site itself is beyond the last dwelling on the left with the row of mature trees along the site frontage. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows the general scale and character of dwellings to both the north and south side of Dalbiti Road in the immediate vicinity of the site. Next slide. And this is a view along the Dobiti Road frontage with 47 Dobiti Roads uh, to the left hand side of the photo and it bounds directly onto the application site. The row of mature trees is a dominant feature along this frontage and contributes significantly to the character and amenity of the area and the approach into Dumfries from the west. Next slide. Moving along Dobiti Road, this is a reverse view looking back along the site frontage. Uh, the tree closest in the photo marks the western corner of the site is one of those intended for removal. Next slide, please. Moving across the road, this photo looks across the site in a northeasterly direction with the area designated as a scheduled monument in the foreground. Next slide, please. Turning to look back across Dobiti Road, this slide shows the scale and character of the dwellings um, in the immediate vicinity of the site. Next slide, please. Moving slightly further back along the site frontage, this is a view across the site in an easterly direction. Next slide, please. Heading back towards the northeast boundary of the site, this photo looks towards 47 Dalbiti Road, which currently has a relatively open boundary to the application site and would be located in closest proximity to the proposed care home building. Next slide, please. Panning round to the right, this is a view across the site towards 14 Park Road, which was also bound the site to the northeast. Uh, the area between this property and 47 WT Rose is the area proposed for parking and also for refuse storage. Next slide, please. 
Um, this final photograph from Dalbeti Road shows the relationship of the mature trees to the site boundary. These trees are located within the grass verge area between the fields and the metalled surface of the road. It is noted that the proposals include the extension of the footway along the south side of Dalbeti Road in this northern corner and provision of a footpath into the site, although it's not clear how this can be provided without damage to the trees in this location. Next slide, please. Crossing over to Park Road, uh, this is a view as you approach the site as you leave Dumfries. The site lies beyond the hedge in the, the centre of the photo and the dwellings which can be seen on the right are 11 and 12 Park Road with 14 Park Road just beyond. The land over the hedge to the left is flat open farmland which is located out with the settlement boundary. Next slide. Moving closer to the site, this is a view looking west across the site from the boundary of 14 Park Road, and that looks back across towards Dalpeti Road. Next slide, please. This slide shows the proposed point of vehicular access to the site from Park Road, which would be co located close to the entrance to 14 Park Road, uh, which is just to the right of the photo. Next slide. Moving along Park Road, this photo looks back along the site frontage. Uh, the tree in the centre of the photograph marks the corner of the application site and is one of those proposed to be felled. Next slide. Travelling slightly further out Park Road to a point adjacent to Pyramont Villas, this photo looks back towards the application site. Next slide. And this final photograph looks north across the site from Park Road back towards Dalbeti Road with 14 Park Road and 47 Dalbeti Road to the right hand side of the photo and Lismore and Faywick on Dalbeti Road to the left and therefore this slide shows the full extent of the application site. Next slide. And thank you Chair, that concludes my presentation. Thanks very much Lindsay. Uh, members, this is questions for Case Officer, Councillor Campbell. Uh, thanks, Chair, and thanks, Lindsay, for your presentation. Uh, is it possible to go back to the uh, slide with the uh, uh, Neolithic monument in the wider area, please? Yeah, that one there. Uh, could you tell us if the, the actual... Uh, development will actually encroach on the scheduled monument. Thank you. Lindsay. Um, the development, no, will not physically um, encroach onto the scheduled area. As you can see from that slide, uh, the red line of the application site um, follows the northern extent of the scheduled area. Uh, so there wouldn't be any physical encroachment onto the site. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, John. Thanks, Lindsay. Any other questions for the case officer? Councillor Wood. Thank you, Chair. It's asked Lindsay on, I think it was at the beginning there, there was a few slides showing different roof heights. Could you bring that one back up? Because there's one building that showed itself to be somewhat higher. Yes, it's the third one down to the left. What was that building? Uh, the on the, on the third image down. It's on the third slide. Aye, the third. It seems to be shrouded in trees, Lindsay, and it's shaded in white in the third image down. Yes, that's a two two story uh, dwelling called Stormont. Um, it's not particularly visible in the photographs um, that have been taken because, um, as Councillor Dempster was saying, um, it is quite. Um, quite surrounded by mature trees and there is a large mature hedge along that boundary. So it's not uh, particularly well appreciated from the street scene. So Lynch, is that not representative of the, the actual uh, property as it would be seen visually? Um, there would be a greater view of the property from the Park Road side, uh, but from Dalbeti Road, um, I say it is quite well enclosed. It's only when you're looking directly across towards it um, that you would be able to see it. Thanks very much, Lindsay. You want to come back, Andrew? Yes, uh, thank you, Jim. It was really just to identify what is the height difference that we're talking about. 
Anjay. In terms of the ridge level of the, the dwelling or the, the site level? Uh, Lindsay, it's to do with, if you look at the proposed building roof height and then the roof height of the um, house behind it, what would the height difference be? Um, I, would have, I would have to measure that off. Um, I can do that if you'd like me to come back to you. That'll be fine, Lindsay. If you do that, please, that'll be grand. And we'll okay. either, we'll come back to either before we go in session or if you have time, if there are no other questions, you, you can indicate when you've got that information for us. I've got Councillor Stephen Thompson. Stephen? Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, it mentions uh, in one of the conditions, just in the report, uh, condition three on page 42, um, about, sorry, page, page 42, um, the proposed development would be contrary to, and then it goes on to say, it's not been demonstrated that there is a specific need for the development in the proposed location exceptional circumstance. Uh, and earlier on page 28, when it talks about this initially, um, in paragraph, or sort of recommendation, it's got J as the sort of letter for the recommendation at the top of the page. It says, um, the adverse impact isn't one that would pass the threshold for a recommendation for refusal in relation to the impact on cultural heritage. And then it goes on to say, however, cultural archaeologists can still see no exceptional circumstance as required by SPP 145. So I'm just trying to tie it together, the two, one sort of saying it doesn't pass the threshold for it, although there is a, um, the archaeologist has a view, and then it's given as a reason for refusal. So I'm just sort of trying to, trying to square off whether it passes the threshold, and it is a reason, or it's not past the threshold, but there's a view that it should be. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. I think the archaeologist's view was about the threshold, whereas the planning officer view is one of the three reasons for refusing is that uh, it would be contrary to Fraser Galloway LDB plan two. But Lindsay, can you help uh, Councillor Thompson, please? Um, yes, certainly. Um, whilst the council archaeologist has not objected um, in terms of the impact of the development on the scheduled monument, um, there is a requirement within uh, Scottish planning policy at paragraph 145 that any development that would have an adverse impact on a scheduled monument um, requires to have um, a locational justification, i.e. there needs to be exceptional circumstances for the development to be located in that location. Um, the fact that um, the archaeologist um, and also Historic Environment Scotland have not formally objected doesn't mean that they um, support the application. Um, so the reason for refusal um, is on the basis that um, the development doesn't comply with um, LDP2 policy H3, um, which reflects the requirements of Scottish Planning Policy uh, paragraph 145, um, uh, in that there are no exceptional circumstances in this case. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, Councillor Dennerly, did you want to speak? On the, uh, the bottom of the diagram on the right-hand side, uh, there, there's a house um, that's elevated. Does this mean uh, the house will have a good view on the, the care home, meaning there's a lack of privacy, or will there be... Um, trees planted, trees or bushes planted there to cover um, the care home, meaning that um, both the care home and the house has privacy. I'll ask Lindsay to reply. Lindsay, please. Um, I, I assume that that's the, the, the contextual elevation slide again, which shows the two-storey property of Stormont. Um, yes, it would look down over to the application site. Um, however, there are the row of mature trees along the Dobiti Road boundary, which will provide a degree of screening um, and reduce the impact on Stormont um, from, from views of the proposed development. 
Uh, whilst Mr or Councillor Denley is uh, considering that, can you maybe show us the trees along Dobiti Road that might help uh, show how the screen would, would, would be placed? Lindsay, please. Um, yes, that slide is probably um, a good one to show. Uh, there is almost a continuous canopy, certainly during the summer months, um, along the Dobiti Road frontage. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Denneley, are you satisfied with that reply? Thank you. Yes, thank uh, you very Council much. Thank you. Councillor Wood again. Thank you, Chair. It was just Lindsay. There was mention of a path that might have an impact on the trees, and you were awaiting clarification on what was going to happen there. Has that been forthcoming yet, or where do we stand on that? Lindsay. Um, yes, if you, Fiona, if you could go to slide, um, slide number seven, I think, showing the proposed block plan. That's, that one would do as well. That, that one does show it too, but. Yes, um, in the, the northern corner of the site, you can see that there is a proposed footpath um, extending towards the northern boundary, and then there would propose to be a slight extension to um, the, the public footway um, to connect up with that. Um, if we could then go to slide... Just bear with me a second while I find the best one. Slide number 23, please. Oh, back one. And again, back another one. Oh, yeah, that slide's probably the best one. Um, the bottom image um, is probably the, the best one there because um, you're looking directly along Dalbiti Road, you can see that the trunk of um, that first tree um, wouldn't allow um, a footway of the required um, width, which is normally 1.8 metres. Uh, the footway would butt directly up against um, that tree trunk um, and therefore is likely to have uh, an adverse impact, would certainly damage that tree and would probably require it to be removed in order to um, form that footway and footpath. Sorry, back, Andrew. Sorry to come back on this, but has there been a tree survey done as to establish that the trees have to stay in place or that tree has to stay in place? There was some survey done because two of them had been found to be in poor condition, but I don't know what the intensity of this tree survey was. Lindsay, can you help? Um, yes, certainly, Chair. Um, yes, there was a tree survey done. Um, the tree constraints plan that goes with that survey um, forms part of the slides, um, and we can go back to that, um, should you wish. That is slide number six, so it's near the beginning, Fiona. That's it there. So that shows um, all of the trees um, which have been assessed by an arboriculturalist. Um, there are two trees which are proposed to be felled, um, one in the extreme western corner and the one on Park Road in the southern, southern side of the site. Um, the one uh, or the two in the area of the proposed footpath and extension to the public footway in the north of the site there are indicated as being retained. Um, however, the footpath and footway would clearly be well within the proposed tree protection areas. Um, so it is unlikely that they could be retained um, in order to form those footways. Thanks, Andrew. A question still for the case officer. Don't see anything more on the chat function. Oh, a uh, Councillor Beretti. Thank, thank you, Chair. In relation to that particular question, um, given that there is an intended footpath, how would that impact on the lighting situation? Because I was, I 
believe that we'd be lighting registry, uh, reg uh, legislation that would cover footpaths. And with all those trees there, how would that be affronted? Lindsay? In terms of street lighting? Yes. Um, the footway uh, is a very short extension, um, so um, I, there was no further requirement for street lighting along the southern side of Dalbeatty Road. Um, but um, I think if we refer to the photographs, you will be, you'll be able to see um, what the existing provision is. So there, there are some street lighting columns there on the um, southern side of Dalbeatty Road. Um, and I think if you go through um, a few more of the photographs, Fiona, there, there you will see um, see a few more. If you carry on, yes, there's a, a re reverse view as well. You can, you can see um, a street lighting column there at the um, western corner of the site as well. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. Okay, if there are no other questions for our case officer, we'll go to the first representer, which is uh, David Fallis, who has a petition. He's the agent on behalf of the residents of Dalbeatty Road and Park Road. I believe a statement is spread out by Tracy, and there are 31 objectors. The council holds a list of the names and addresses, but clearly they won't be published in this document. So Tracy will read out the, the statement, and there are 31 objectors or signatories to the statement. Tracy, oh, and I should say at the outset as well, we always stick strictly to three minutes. So if your statement goes beyond that, just draw it to a conclusion at three minutes, Tracy, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, as the Chair stated, this is a statement on behalf of the residents of Dalbeatty Road and Park Road. Dear Chairman and members of the committee, out of respect for the committee, its process and members' time, we do not wish to delay the consideration of this matter with multiple personal representations to the committee on the day. Instead, to ensure our collective concerns and continued objections to these plans for this site are made known to the committee, we should be grateful if this short statement could be read out at the appropriate time when the item is being considered. We wish to compliment the thoroughness of the report and the support it contains in respect of the matters of objection the group has, has in respect of this proposal. It comprehensively deals with the group's concerns and objections to the proposal and presents our case against the development fairly and proportionately and we commend it to the members of the committee. We should like to thank the case officer for her overwhelming support of the points of concern that we have made against the proposal and express our support on the very solid and clearly expressed arguments against the development that the report contains. We would like it to be noted on the meeting record that we commend this report, its contents and recommendation, and respectfully request that the councillors agree with the informed opinion of its officials in this particular instance and refuse planning permission for the development for the reasons set out at the end of it. Thank you. Thanks, Trace. And given that that's a statement, there, there are no questions in relation to that statement. So we move on to the applicants. We have Derek Scott with us. If you'd like to come forward, please, accompanied by Linda Meston. Also online to answer any specific questions are Neil Dobby, Land Director, Simply UK, Gillian Shields, Director, Convey Prentice Shields Architects, and George Moody, Senior Archaeologist. I understand, folks, that you have a, a, a video you'd want to show, but we will confine your time to three minutes. So whether you show the video or, or have it playing whilst you address the committee, that's entirely up to you. Uh, I'll remind you 30 seconds ago to go to bring a presentation to a conclusion. And just whenever you're ready, thank you very much. Good morning, councillors. You have before you an application for the development of a new care home facility in Dumfries, the first, if approved, that will be built in this town since the turn of the millennium, some 22 years ago. The last few years and the devastating consequences of COVID in particular are revolutionising care home design. 
The Care Inspectorate, the government body which scrutinises the design of such facilities, have raised the bar considerably, all with the aim of creating much safer and better environments for those in need of care. The care home proposed in this site, which represents a multi-million pound investment, not only meets but exceeds the Inspectorate's requirements and would provide an unrivalled facility of truly exceptional quality, bringing with it significant job creation and associated economic benefits. There is an immediate and undisputed need for a 60-bed care home facility in this town. Furthermore, none of the existing care homes in the area would now meet the Care Inspectorate's registration requirements for new facilities. These considerations should, in my opinion, be at the forefront of your minds in determining this application today. Three reasons have been put forward for refusal, raising, broadly speaking, two issues. The first relating to the impact of the proposal on the setting of the adjoining scheduled monument, and the second relating to the siting and design of the building proposed. Significantly, Historic Environment Scotland and your Council's archaeologist do not consider that the degree of impact on the setting of the adjoining scheduled monument is sufficient to warrant the refusal of the application. However, your Council's archaeologist, on the back of, in our minds, a misrepresentation of a single sentence in Scottish planning policy, has formed the opinion that the scheme should only be approved if there are exceptional circumstances. Is the need to address both a quantitative and qualitative shortfall in care home bed spaces in this town not an exceptional circumstance? Your planning department are unfortunately of the view that the care home should be located elsewhere and not on this site. They have been advised in response to this position that our clients are not able to identify another site in the town, which is firstly suitable, secondly available and thirdly can be viably developed for a care home facility of the nature proposed. Your planning department, whilst obviously disagreeing with this, have not come forward with any suggestions as to where such a facility could be located. The second issue relates to design, with particular concern expressed about the scale and massing of the building proposed. Whilst the building by necessity has a larger footprint than other buildings in the immediate locale, the perception of scale and mass has been considerably reduced by the layout of its footprint and through the introduction of various architectural features in reflection of those found in the wider area, all with the purpose of relating the building to its surrounding context. We have submitted a number of photomontages and other images showing the proposed building within its context in support of the application, which I hope will assist you in assessing the appropriateness of the scheme proposed. You have 30 seconds to go. That is all I'm able to say in the, in the limited time available. Um, however, I'm more than happy to take any questions or, where necessary, to refer them to uh, other members of our design team who the Chair have, has introduced. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for being so concise. Uh, so, questions for the applicant and agent, and we've got Councillor Denley, uh, uh, first question. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, I know there's lots of legislation and high standards that must be met in terms of care homes, because it's important for elderly people to, to live in high quality care. Um, you spoke about the other care homes um, that are less quality. Um, was, does this new building affect the other care homes? Um, because, uh, you know, could this result in closures? Um, because we're setting up a 60 bed care home, will you be able to facilitate um, the beds for other care homes that may close? Um, Mr Chair, would it be okay if I brought in my colleague uh, Linda Meston to answer that particular question? Linda is the uh, Managing Director of Moore Living, who would be the operators of the care home facility. No, that's fine. I think the only worry I have is that it's no strictly speaking a question about the planning application. It's more about the wider context of service provision. But I certainly, if you can answer that, would be fine. Thank you. What we have found in the past, and we would expect here, is that it would add to and answer your need for further care home beds. Where we have opened elsewhere, we have not closed other care homes, although by necessity some smaller care homes who have been uh, completely against the current regulations have, through necessity for infection control, been closed. But our aim is not to close, but to actually provide sufficient number of beds to meet the need that's been highlighted within the area in a manner which the planning and the development is designed into small scale areas which allow better infection control, fewer cross infections to be able to take place within the building, giving a much more homely atmosphere and a safer environment for all who choose to live there. 
Thanks very much. Thanks for your response. But can we just confine the questions to planning matters, please? Stephen? Uh, thanks, Chair. Yeah, and I suppose on any other committee, the Council um, members would be interested in health and social care provision in the region. But on this particular committee, it's just a question about um, the scheduled monument. Uh, obviously, I'd asked the question earlier, and I think we'd heard from, um, from another question that the, the proposed site isn't actually on, but is adjacent to the scheduled monument site as outlined on the map, which it, which is a sort of road going through it as well, which is interesting. But um, I just sort of wondered, you, you mentioned that there was a, an interpretation given by the archaeologist there, which was slightly different from the SPP 145, um, which I think says where there's a potential for a proposed development to, ha to have an adverse effect on the scheduled monument or on the integrity of its setting, permission should only be granted where there are exceptional circumstances. And you talked a little bit about that. Can you maybe, can you maybe detail why you think your interpretation is more accurate than, than our own planning staff? Please. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Councillor. Could I bring in our archaeologist uh, on teams to uh, deal with this particular issue? By all means, aye. Uh, good morning, members and kinsmen. Uh, my name is George Moody. I'm a senior archaeologist with CFA Archaeology, and I was uh, the project manager for the uh, cultural heritage impact assessment part of this. Um, to address the councillor's specific question, uh, SBP uh, quite clearly says that where there is a potential for a proposed development to have an adverse effect on a scheduled monument or on the integrity of the, its setting, Permission should only be granted where there are exceptional circumstances. Uh, my reading of that is that it is the integrity of the setting that is the, the key question to be addressed. And I think in the uh, responses from Historic Environment Scotland and from the councillor, uh, council's archaeologist, it's, it's quite clear that they do not believe that the integrity of the setting is compromised sufficiently to to warrant an objection. In my reading, the key elements that contribute to the integrity of the setting are the views that relate to the cultural significance of the monument, how it's, what it actually is and how it's perceived. And in my reading, those are the views to the east and the west along the alignment of the Cursus monument and the open aspect views to the south. In particular, uh, a view towards the southwest, where at the midsummer or the midwinter solstice, uh, the sun sets in a noticeably uh, visual cleft in the skyline of the hills to the southwest. The Cursus Monument itself is a is a ritual or ceremonial type of monument from the Neolithic period, and it seems that to our ancestors at that time, these views and these uh, astronomical alignments were a key consideration in how they conducted their affairs, shall we say, at that time. So to specifically answer that question, I do not believe that the integrity of the monument, the setting of the monument, is adversely affected. And therefore, the exceptional circumstances test in SPP 145 is not invoked. I hope that answers the question sufficiently. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comprehensive reply. I suppose that satisfies Stephen. Yeah, very interesting reply um, for various reasons. But I think I think what what I take from that is that one the the view from yourself is it doesn't invoke the test, but one of your colleagues said that actually there are exceptional circumstances where this this should be considered. So it's really it's almost like a sort of belt and braces approach, I guess. But um, so it either doesn't invoke the test, or if it does, there are exceptional circumstances which is the need for a care home. So it's just to, to get that rounded sense of the presentation being made. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, sir. Any other questions for the applicant or agent? Councillor Wood. Thank you, Chair. It's to do with Scottish water, and clearly there's no objections there. However, there is concern about capacity and more so to do with um, surface waters that you're not going to be able to connect into the waste system, which is a recognised uh, situation with Scottish water. Where 
do you intend to dispose of that water into the local authority drains, or what is this, the proposal? Um, I, as you will appreciate, uh, Councillor, um, matters to do with surface water disposal are technical matters that would normally follow the grant of planning permission as opposed to being uh, considered um, at this particular time um, for the planning application. Uh, Actually, we had a, a care home approved in Dunfermline yesterday in very, very similar circumstances uh, where uh, Scottish water approval hadn't come forward. But in essence, there are a number of options for the disposal of uh, surface water from the site. Uh, we are in continued negotiations with uh, Scottish water uh, in terms of the possibility of um, disposing it to the combined sewer. We're also looking at the possibility of disposing the water to a, uh, a natural source and the third option is um, the possibility of recycling as much of the water as possible uh, within the development. Um, so, that, so there are three options there. I have no doubt that there is a solution there, um, but it's, it's, it's the next stage of the design process and a very expensive stage of the design process if and when planning permission is granted. No, thanks, Chair. That's just all I want you to know that they uh, you know, made consideration for that. Thanks, Andrew. Okay. Oh, Councillor Walters, Keith, please. Yeah, sorry, just going back to the the, the recommended decision, uh, where it says the, on the second point, the pro proposed development will be out of scale and overly dominant. Um, the agent said that they were referring to that, but I can't see anything from what they've said that actually um, actually counters that um, that argument. The, the picture you showed of the um, of the proposed development behind the trees. Did you have a picture of the of it, how it would look as you drive into Dumfries, for instance, or from Park Park Row? This is yes. The... Yes, we do have a, a picture of, uh, of the uh, care home as you look into the site, or as you drive into Dumfries along Dalbeatty Road. Um, right, I'm not sure if you can see it on Teams. It's it's very difficult to see it here in the chamber. Unfortunately, the quality of the of the projector is, is very, very poor. Um, no, that's fine. That's fine. I can see. I didn't. I didn't see that last slide. So okay. Fine. Okay. And Thank we also you. we also have an image of the uh, care home from Park Road as well, which I think is the next image. So that is the a view you will see from Park Road, looking directly into the entrance. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. So, if there are no other questions for the applicant, agent, and his team, eh, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for the presentation and thank you for the responses you gave to members. That will conclude your eh, involvement in the meeting. Thank you. And members are now in session. Councillor Drybra. Yeah, th thanks very much, Chair. And, and re reading this um, the report is, is obviously, you know, there's a lot of things here that are not planning materials, um, and we have to deal with planning materials, uh, including this. There, there is there is some issues, uh, I believe, that are rightly raised by the objectors in this particular case. Um, there is no doubt there's a need for care homes. You know, we're, we're, we know that all over Dumfries and Galloway. However, we we, have, we are here as a, a planning application, and in this particular case, I, I suggest that we actually go with the recommendations on this one for the reasons suggested in the report. And that's all three recommended decisions as set out in the paper, Councillor Driver. That's correct, Chair. Thank you. Any other views or proposals? I've got Councillors up, Councillor Wood. Just a wee bit of clarification. When you look at the planning background, um, is it 99P3166, which was 24 houses, and then the next one, 98P3400, <coughs> was 29 houses. Is there a reason why we took out this reference to the schedule monument in one application compared to the other? And was that anything to do with the point that was raised by the applicant about interpretation of the SPP 145? Lindsay, I'm hoping you'll be able to help Councillor Hislop with that. If not, pass it to David. Uh, yes, 
Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, a couple of the earliest planning applications included um, development within the scheduled area, um, as well as um, the proposed application site that we have before us now. Um, and um, that is certainly why the um, reason for refusal included the impact on the fabric of the scheduled ancient monument um, in the um, original refusal. Um, it's also referred to in the reporter's decision um, for the, the later appeal. Um, and uh, the smaller developments um, which came forward um, in 2008 um, included um, the area of the current um, application site, I believe. Thanks, Lindsay. I'll ask David if he can just embellish on that. Uh, thanks, Chair. Yes, I think it also relates to the development plan that was around at that time. 1998, you'll note it was the, the Dumfries local plan that was adopted. By the time of 1999, you had the, the finalised draft structure plan, which I think for the first time actually introduced policies in archaeology. So that will have been the material change. Thanks, Ivor. Councillor Wood. Thank you, Chair. I actually take uh, the opposing view from uh, the other elected member in that I believe that this development is paramount and required. I see that uh, no reason for you know, uh, the objection on the historic uh, site. I do believe it is in the correct location. It is approximately half a mile away from the hospital. I can't think of a better sighting for such a development. I think there's a lot of thought and consideration has gone into both the design and the location of it within the site. Uh, so therefore, I would propose that we actually I agree with uh, taking this forward as a development. Normally, we expect planning reasons and no agreeing with the officer is not a planning reason. So I would expect you to give planning reasons why you would go against the recommendation. It's suggested here about the character of the natural build-up to the edge of the settlement cause significant adverse effects to landscape setting. Uh, out of scale and overly dominant in the landscape setting and relation to adjacent housing. So you'll have to come up with some form of words that uh, governance will accept that would counteract or, 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 or counter what the case officer has proposed. Well, that is exactly what I was trying to put over, is that I do not believe it has a significant adverse effect on the landscape. I believe that a lot of thought has gone into the design of the uh, building, nor do I believe that it has any major impact on the uh, historical site. And as I say, the location which is also within here, is stating that it's not the correct location. I am challenging that and stating that it is the correct location as it's an el for the elderly and the hospital is not, the hospital's location is not that far away from the, from the actual site. I would have thought that, that those are planning considerations, aren't they? I don't think it is, and the officer is quite clearly in the report. There could be many locations where the, where the development could take place. This, in her view, is not the appropriate one. So, uh, OK, we'll accept that as a proposal. I'm happy to second Councillor Driver's motion. Councillor Aslop. Chair, uh, you beat me to it. I think that knowing that area of Dumfries, it's sort of big villas and bungalows, and it's a traditional area, and we're putting a brand new building in there, I think, that doesn't actually sit with their policies with regard to the two and three especially. Um, I'm not so convinced about one, that it's an adverse impact on the ancient monument. There will be some impact. And if it's deemed to be in, I'm happy to accept that one. But I think the other two, I don't think the building is suitable in that location um, because of the landscape and the uh, sort of built heritage of the area. 
Thank you, hey, Councillor Haslett. We've got three speakers. I've got Councillor Marshall, who was first on Teams or, or on the chat. Then I've got Councillor Campbell in the room, followed by Councillor Juicy. So I've got Councillor Marshall, John Campbell and Andrew Juicy. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> yeah, I just had actually had a look at SPP 2000, um, 2014 para 145, and it does state within there the exceptions, but what it doesn't state is is a care home. I think the nearest the, uh, is F, which is limited affordable housing for local community needs. So I think although the applicants have said they do believe it's except, exceptional circumstances, a care home is not listed as one of those circumstances. Thanks, Sean. Councillor Campbell. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, I, I've got a bit of sympathy for the applicants, uh, particularly when Historic Environment Scotland said that the, you, you know there's no significant uh, national issues, and even the uh, council archaeologists. But I think uh, just because they they raise no objections uh, for this particular uh, application. I think what's happened here is they've probably decided to try and squeeze too much in such a small area that it then has the detrimental effect of having the, the scale and the mass, which uh, obviously will stand out pretty significantly. So uh, I'm happy to go with the recommendations of the officers as well. Thanks very much, Councillor Campbell. Councillor Juicy, Councillor Thompson, then I intend to go to determination. Andrew? I've got a lot of sympathy for this proposal as well. I think when you look at um, the reports, that it doesn't seem that we are going to be that it's going to be invading too much into any historical environment. Um, I would like to second Councillor Wood's proposal that, uh, in that in that basis. Uh, I believe he had a motion on the table, but I didn't quite hear. I've not got a great signal here. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I think I have a, a few misgivings about the third reason for refusal. I'm, I'm sort of comfortable enough with the first two. I think obviously there's a, a character um, for the particular, an established character for that location. And this would certainly, I think any develop, all development will affect the character of a location. That's the nature of development. It's whether or not it's uh, justified, I suppose, but um, or in line with policy. But um, but I think in this case, uh, I think the balance is probably in favour of the, the status quo. But the, the third reason for refusal I'm not comfortable with at all. I don't think, I, I would sympathise with the view that it doesn't actually trigger the, um, the requirement as the, as the applicant's um, uh, team member said. For exceptional circumstances, I think once you get into the realm of needing to show exceptional circumstances, that's where you're into um, having to demonstrate something that maybe can't be demonstrated. But I'm certainly happy to refuse in the first two grounds, not so much in the third, but hey ho, do you know what I mean? That's that's my view on that one. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stephen. Okay, on that note, we'll go to the the vote, please. Tracy, if you can remind members what the proposals amendment are, and then we'll go to the vote. Thanks, Chair. Can I just seek clarification on the amendment from Councillor Wood and Justy? Um, I've noted here to approve the proposed development as it would not have a significant adverse effect on the landscape setting or the cultural heritage of the immediate area. And is there anything else you want to add to that and any conditions that you want to attach to the application? Yes, the only condition that I would be wanting to add, uh, if Andrew's in support, and that is that the trees, the preservation of the trees is uh, upheld. I'd be surprised if members of this committee were willing to just give them a, an applicant carte blanche, and I would expect that we'd have standard conditions placed on any approval, and I would trust that we'd maybe delegate the officers for that rather than just give carte blanche. That's no a normal process. No, in fairness to you, I agree. It's, uh, but it's, as I say, it's more just to emphasise the preservation of trees because that has the blinding effect and you know, would help to bring the building into character with the surrounding area. Thanks, Andrew. David, do you want to add what standard conditions might be applied in order to protect the, the integrity of the site and the wider 
a development area. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, there are a number of conditions which roads officers would have been looking for, particularly to do with the uh, car parking provision access onto Park Road. Uh, and certainly, I think in Lindsay's report, there is noting about the fact that there's a number of other issues, such as the tree protection uh, that would have been looking for in any event. C can I also clarify, um, perhaps with Tracy, really, that the, I noted Councillor Wood had stated that the proximity to the hospital was one of the justifications for making an exception to policy. Is that something you would want to include in that? Councillor Wood? Yes. I have a feeling that's no, no, no a, a policy matter, but David? Well, well, the reason for mentioning it is because Councillor Wood mentioned it and it was almost, if I'm reading what was said correctly, it was your reason for for it being an exceptional circumstance because of its yes, proximity. So, so sorry, Chair. It's just as a, a material matter. That's why I was bringing it up. It, had it not been for elderly residential uh, care, then I would not have used that. But in, in light of the fact the purpose it has been built I feel that it is extremely important that it is located in that vicinity. So there's a risk that the next one comes up that it's known near the hospital will reject it because it's too far away. But anyway, we'll leave that for another day. Tracy, can you then read out the, well, the motions officer's recommendation, read out the amendment, please, and then go to the vote. Thanks, Chair. So the motion is proposed by Councillor Dempster, seconded, sorry, Councillor Dreiber, seconded by Councillor Dempster. That's to refuse the application on the grounds detailed in the report. And the amendment is proposed by Councillor Wood, seconded by Councillor Giusti, to approve the application on this development as it would not cause significant adverse effect on the landscape setting or the cultural heritage of the immediate area, and that the location of this development um, is justification for exceptional circumstances as it is close to the local hospital. And the, ground, the conditions to be attached would be delegated to offers which would, officers, which will include the roads conditions and the tree protection conditions and any others that officers deem fit. Thanks, Tracy. Go to the vote. Chairman. Motion. Vice Chair. Motion. Councillor Beretti. Motion. Councillor Blake. Motion. Councillor Campbell. Motion. Councillor Crothers. Motion. Councillor Dashbar. Motion. Councillor Dennerly. Motion. Councillor Dreiber. Motion. Councillor Giusti. Amendment. Councillor Hill. Amendment. Councillor Howey. Ah, motion. Councillor Hislop. Motion. Councillor Marshall. Motion. Councillor Thompson. Motion. Councillor Walters. Motion. And Councillor Wood. Amendment. And the motion is carried 14 votes to three, so the application has been refused on the grounds detailed in the report. Thank you, members. We go on to agenda item number six. An application for the siting of four glamping pods with associated decked areas, formation of access paths and car parking area. And <laughs> Billy, are you looking to speak? Well, he's in the. Are you muted now? Good. Okay, I'll start again, Billy. Site an application for the siting of four glamping pods with associated decked areas, formation of access paths and car parking area, installation of shared sewage treatment plant and associated works at Windsor Lodge, Windsor Road, Newton Stewart. The application types of full planning permission, reference number 21 stroke 2478 stroke full. The recommendations approve subject conditions and the case officer is Billy Murray. Billy, I see you with us, so you take us through your presentation, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Good morning, all. 
Um, this, as you say, this is an application for the siting of four small glamping pods on a site on the northwestern edge of Newton Stewart. I'll take you through the slides. The first slide shows the application site location plan. Uh, it's quite a, a, an extensive uh, site in terms of its length, but compact in terms of its context. Um, next slide, please. This is a slide that shows again that the application site, uh, as highlighted in the report, this site is something of an anomaly in that it is actually within the settlement boundary of Newton Stewart, uh, whereas to all intents and purposes it appears as a countryside site, uh, particularly at the moment. This slide shows the overlay from LDP2 constraints map um, the pink land uh, to the west, that's the left of the application site and curving round to the, the north, uh, is defined within the settlement boundary now in LDB2, and that is allocated housing land. Again, that is highlighted in the constraints section of the committee report. Next slide, please. This is an aerial view of the site. And this is with the, uh, the total applicants land holding outlined in blue. This is simply to highlight uh, what I said a moment ago in terms of the anomalous nature of this site, whereas it's actually set within a very extensive land holding associated with Windsor Lodge, which extends to some 2.5 hectares or thereby, and the site is within uh, that area. Uh, Part of the land holding towards the house is uh, landscaped and well-maintained gardens. Uh, the actual site in the northern part where the pods themselves are proposed and, and the, the treatment plant for the wastewater uh, is within a, 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 a more of a grass paddock, shall we say, which will be shown in the, in the forthcoming slides. Next slide, please. So this is a view of the site approaching from the north. That's at the, the final gate on the landscape part of the garden looking into the grass paddock. Um, there is that existing timber building on the site at the moment. The pods would be in the distance in this view uh, and set at an angle along the, the left-hand boundary, which is that dry stone dike. Next slide, please. This is again a closer view showing, showing where the pods would be. They'd be on the left, backing against the dike in this view. Next slide, please. This is a closer view of the, the site of the pods, um, showing the existing uh, stone boundary wall that would be retained. The land to the left of that boundary wall is the allocated housing land that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and you can note the telecommunications mast that's over the dike from the proposed pods in that view. Next slide. That's again a closer view. That's where more where the actual pods would be set at an angle against the, that dike. Next slide. This is a view of the slight extension uh, in the site uh, where the proposed treatment plant is to be located. Next slide. This is again an equivalent view of that area looking to the northeast. Next slide. This is looking back down the site from the north. In that view, the boundary dike is on the right and the pods would be angled on, on the right side of that view. Next slide. This is a view from the pod location to the southeast. Uh, I've included that more or less to highlight the fact that um, to indicate how the landform falls from there. From the tree line there, the landform forms much more steeply towards an existing uh, pedestrian pathway with residential properties beyond that, only on Cunningham Terrace. Um, as highlighted in the report, again, the distance from the proposed pods to the nearest residential property is something in the order of 100 plus metres. Um, given that, and the character of the intervening land, as I've just highlighted, it's the, the tree cover and the sloping nature and the distance from residential properties. Uh, it's considered that there would be no adverse immunity effect from the pods on existing residential properties. 
And there certainly would be no overlook at that distance and with that character of intervening land. Next slide. This is just a view looking back up in the northwestern corner of the site, again showing the proximity of the, the telecommunications mast. Uh, and to highlight, uh, in terms of consideration of the, the wastewater treatment plant and the representation that was made in terms of access for emptying, um, the applicant has indicated that an agreement is in place to utilise the existing track to that telecommunications uh, mast for uh, maintenance trucks or, or a tanker to empty the, the treatment plant to use that access. And there is an existing gate that you can just see there. Uh, there's a gap in the wall, so the, 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 the tank would be accessible quite easily from that location. Next slide, please. That's a view just back up across the site, again showing the, the allocated housing land on the other side of the dike in that view. Next slide, please. This is an area on the, the eastern side of the site, uh, the southeastern part of the site. That's just to indicate where some short sections of new pathway would be required. In the main, the communicating paths from the site to the car parking area are existing garden paths, but some lengths of new path would be required in that area. Next slide. That's again just to show the sloping nature of the site. Next slide, please. Uh, the next three or so slides are just examples of the connecting paths in the landscape part of the garden leading from the pod site to the proposed small car park. Next slide, please. Again, this is a sample path. Next slide. And again, the same thing. Next slide. This is the location of the proposed car park. Uh, it would be in the grass in that view, just off the hard standing against the gable of Windsor Lodge. Next slide. Again, that's just a closer view of the proposed car parking area. You can see there are residential properties beyond that. Um, there's an existing boundary treatment there, and the, the pedestrian path from Windsor Road to York Drive leads along and intervenes between the application site and the houses there. Next slide, please. Uh, Again, that's just another view from the south of the proposed car park. The car park would be in the grass area on the right in that view. Next slide. This is just a, a view of looking back from the proposed car park towards the access along the existing uh, connecting track from the, the road access to the proposed car park. Next slide. Uh, this is from inside the site, looking at the existing access. Uh, you can see the stone walls and railings at the access at the moment. Next slide. Um, that's a view in the other direction. The track on the right would be the track that was used for traffic for, for cars uh, to reach the proposed car park. On the left, you can see the extensive forecourt of Windsor Lodge at the moment that would be available for parking if there was any requirement for such. Uh, I would say, however, that, that the proposal for four car parking spaces for four small pods meets the requisite standard. There were legitimate concerns about potential for increased on-street parking on Windsor Road, which is already restricted. But I think I mentioned in my report that uh, that there would be no pressure for such on-street parking. Uh, and if there was any need, there's more than adequate space in front of the house at the moment for off-street parking. Next slide. This is a view of the access itself from Windsor, Low, Windsor Road. sorry, uh, And the small gate on the right is the entrance to the pedestrian path from Windsor Road towards York Drive. Um, next slide, please. This is a closer view of the access. You'll see it's it's rather complicated at the moment with stone dikes, uh, and it's at an angle to the public road, whereas the normal expectation would be that, that 
Access is would meet the public road at 90 degrees. Uh, the roads officer has offered no objection in principle, but has indicated that uh, ag agreement of an appropriate access would be required before works were undertaken. Uh, and part of the recommendation is a, con is a condition uh, to secure that requirement. Next slide, please. This is a view. That's another view of the of the existing access from a slightly different angle. Next slide, please. This is existing visibility uh, down the hill uh, uh, to the east on Windsor Road. You'll see it is somewhat restricted in that view, uh, and that would be part of the condition that would require a minimum visibility in both directions. Next slide, please. This is existing visibility up the hill, which is, is, is more appropriate and less obstructed. Next slide, please. These are just a couple of views of Windsor Road on the approach to the site. Uh, this is Windsor Road from uh, looking west from the bottom of the hill. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is the upper part of, of Windsor Road where it is narrow. And, uh, the, the, as you'll see just on the left there, the, the the footway, the existing footway terminates at that point and Windsor Road kicks in. Uh, and when there are cars parked on the right side of the road and indeed sometimes on the left where the where that wall is, um, that part of Windsor Road can become quite restricted. But as I say in the report, those restrictions in effect uh, act as traffic calming. So by definition, traffic speeds are lower for that reason. Next slide, please. That's a view just looking down on the same down the hill on the same part of Windsor Road. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a couple of views from the public path at the back of Cosby Road uh, up towards the site again to highlight uh, the intervening the character of the intervening land uh, between the site uh, and uh, any residential properties or, or public access pathways. Um, I think you can use the telecommunications mast in the top right hand of that view as a reference point. Uh, the pods would be against the dike just next to that uh, mast. Next slide, please. And this is a view back in the other direction, looking towards your drive, again, to highlight what the land is like between the path and the residential properties and the application site. Next slide. So these are the applicant submissions. This is the location plan. Next slide. That's the layout plan with the, the four pods angled uh, along the northwestern boundary of the site uh, and this the short leg where the treatment plant is to be placed. Next slide. This is uh, uh, elevations and floor plans of the proposed pods. You'll see they're, they're typical of, of the type of pod that is often built nowadays for holiday accommodation. Um, timber cladding, natural timber cladding, cladding and dark coloured shingle, shingles on the roof. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a proposed drainage layout plan. Again, you can see the, the proposed site of the treatment plant and the soak away in blue in the top right hand corner of the red line site in that view. Next slide, please. This is the proposed lighting plan. I'm afraid it's hard to make out in this slide. Um, there are blue dots where, where each low level path light would be proposed. Um, they would be at between five and eight metre spacing along the pathways. Next slide, please. This is an artist's impression of the pods. Next slide, please. Uh, I provided uh, this uh, aerial view of the location site. Next slide, please. Um, they also provided these photographs which pretty much replicate what we've already looked at. Next slide, please. So the application, the, the recommendation is to approve the application subject to conditions. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, Billy. Questions for the case officer?
John Campbell. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Billy, for your presentation. Uh, could there possibly be a health issue with the glamping pods being so close to the telecommunication mast? Billy? Chair, that's not something I could comment on. Okay, David might be able to help us. The only thing I can say is that uh, there's quite long-standing case law that provided um, telecoms must comply with what's called ICNRP, which is to do with non-ionising radiation, then the Scottish Government has decreed that telecom masts will not have an adverse effect on public health, and every application that comes in for telecom masts now must be ICNRP certified. So, short answers, no, I don't think so. Thanks for that, Chair. Thanks, John. Uh, Archie, for the case officer. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Billy. It's coming back to the road conditions on the junction of, of Windsor Road to the access to the point, and obviously it's a... Um, a condition that, 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 that have to be agreed by the developer in this, this instance, but it's going to take away, you know, quite a nice looking wall and, 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 and potentially, should I say, nice looking wall and, and, and um, fence. So, have you had discussions with the devel developer in this case as to what that might look like and, and, and are they happy with the condition? Billy, I guess I'll have to accept well, them. <laughs> Billy? Yeah. I've, I've had no specific discussions with the agent uh, on, on that condition. Um, of course, uh, there's no reason why uh, an access couldn't be constructed to the appropriate standard that would still include attractive walls and railings to some extent or other. Uh, it's more uh, changing the angle of the, the connection to the public road so that it's not at an acute angle moment and it becomes 90 degrees. Clearly, the, the walls would need to be rejigged and relocated to, to some extent. I don't think they would need to be lost completely, uh, but that's without prejudice to considering what they come forward with. And so, uh, condition 7 and 8 on page 57 deals with that, Archie. Any, oh, uh, Tony? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, just to go back to uh, Councillor Driver's point, can, can you confirm, Mr Murray, that those actual walls, they're not historic because they have been redeveloped over the last 30 years, if, not, if I'm not mistaken, so that the, the entrance to the actual property has changed? Thanks, I would agree with you. Councillor Moretti, I would agree with that. We've got local information never goes wrong. A any other questions for our case officer? In that case, Billy, thanks very much for being with us today. Uh, there are no registered speakers, so we're in session. Councillor Driver? Agree with the recommendations, Chair. Stephen, you just go ahead second. Ah, OK. Seems quite unanimous that. Thanks very much, members. Tracy, confirm the decision of the committee, please. Chair, members have approved the application subject to the conditions detailed in the report. Thank you, members. We we'll move on to agenda item number seven. An application for residential and business units development non-compliance with condition five applying permission in principle. Jim. Sorry. Uh, is it possible that we could have a comfort break? It's Absolutely. just for five minutes. Well, ten minutes. Or do you want a lunch break? What time is it? We'll have a lunch break until 12.30. Does that, that suit you, John? All right with that? Is everyone yeah. else happy with that? Yeah. No bother. Okay. Lunch break from now, I resume at 12.30. Thanks very much, members. Thank you.
Thanks, Andy. Good afternoon, members. Welcome back to the second part of the Planning Applications Committee meeting. Councillor Dennerly explained to me during the interval that uh, his interpreter needs a break periodically, so in future at planning meetings, we will regularly have stops every two hours or so to accommodate the, 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 the signal sign language member uh, uh, support. Apologies, I'll get my, my language wrong today. Uh, okay, members, we'll move on to agenda item number seven. An application of residence and business units development, non-compliance with condition five of planning permission and principle, 15 stroke P stroke four stroke 0277, by deleting the reference to dwelling house or within that condition section 42, at former golf course, Annan Road, Gretna. The application types of section 42, reference numbers 21 stroke, 2421 stroke, S42. The recommendation is to approve subject to A, the successful completion of the appropriate legal agreements on six months of the date of the decision, or any extended time scale as agreed by the appointed officer, and B, conditions. Case officers Andrew Robinson. So, Andrew, if you're with us, just explain to members in layman's terms what we're trying to achieve today and then take us through your presentation, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, before I start, I'll, I'll just outline a little bit of the planning history briefly, um, which I think will help to set the scene uh, for this application. Um, a plan, an application for planning permission in principle for a residential and business use development of this site was approved previously in April 2018, and that was approved subject to a legal agreement and eight conditions as listed in paragraph 1.10 of the report. Uh, subsequent to that, um, as part of the planning permission in principle, there's a requirement for um, the detailed proposals to be accompanied by a further application being an approval of matters uh, specified in conditions application. And that was approved in September 2021, so it was September last year when it was reported to the Planning Applications Committee. So that those two applications form the development of that site. The application before you today is seeking non-compliance with with condition five that was attached to the to the planning permission in principle reference and what that condition required was um detailed proposals to widen and provide a footway along um Alonworth road in gretna and as part of that condition it restricted effectively anything in the development from being occupied that being either a any dwelling house or any of the business units from being occupied until the road widening and provision of the footway had been delivered. And what this application is essentially trying to uh, um, facilitate is changing the time scale for implementing the widening of the loan with road works in respect of the residential element. So effectively, the developer is seeking for um, earlier phases of the residential development to be allowed to be occupied of those dwelling houses eventually built and occupied before they have to do um, the widening works which the current re uh, condition restricts so that's the basis for the application uh, moving on to the next slide i will uh, quickly run through where the site is for those that aren't familiar so the site itself is quite a large area of agricultural land located in the western part of gretna and as you can see by the slide, it's bound to the north by Annan Road and uh, residential properties forming Mallor Park. To the east of the site is uh, Raydale Park and the Gretna Social Club. And to the south and west of the site is Loneworth Road, uh, which is really the main subject of this application today. Uh, moving on to the next slide is an aerial view of the site, just to give you a bit more uh, of a, a view of the appearance of the site. And moving on to the next slide, um, the applicant has submitted the 
previously agreed phasing plan that was um, approved last year. So effectively what was approved for the 200 houses is that they would be delivered over eight phases. And in the top right hand corner under phase one, um, you just about note that road widening and footway provision to Lomworth Road was to be completed in phase one. And effectively what's before you today in the application is to to um, amend that to later phase of the development. Moving on to the photographs in the next slide. Um, this is the junction between uh, Lomworth Road and Annan Road. Moving on to the next slide, this is looking south down Lonworth Road, which as you can see, it's, it's a single uh, country lane subject to a national speed limit. Uh, the next photograph shows looking up Lonworth Road towards Annan Road. Uh, the next slide shows a photograph of the bend in Lonworth Road, which following that round, it takes you into the centre of Gretna. And um, moving on to the final photograph is effectively looking back to that location on the right hand side is where a southern access point to serve the residential element was approved as part of the previous application last year. So uh, moving on to the next slide. So in, in summary, uh, um, it's considered that it's not entirely necessary to restrict um, occupation of of all of the dwelling houses prior to um, the loan with road upgrade works being delivered, um, primarily because it's the, the first three phases of the development won't require access from that um, from that location. Um, however, it wasn't accepted with the developers' um, argument to remove that requirement entirely because it's still considered that that southern access is required and um, it, it was considered the applicant's request to restrict only phase eight was also considered by officers but not accepted for the reasons in paragraph 4.17 of the report mainly because there will be a requirement for three access points as well as an emergency vehicle access after a 100 dwellings which is likely to be required in around phase four so um the condition that's being recommended is that the exact time scale um, as set out in recommended condition five in the report um, it's recommended that the future phasing plan that will be required to be submitted with any application stipulate the exact time scale as to when that uh, work is required to be implemented and therefore it's recommended for approval on those bases but also subject to the same conditions with some minor tweaks to um, the previous conditions to address uh, um, typos and also the legal agreements because this would result in a brand new planning permission in principle being delivered for the site it's important that all previous requirements and the legal agreement are carried over to a new planning permission in principle uh, that concludes my presentation and happy to answer any questions. Thanks very much, Andrew. And just to be absolutely clear, all the conditions will still require to be met, but we know at the same rate as the first permission uh, required, there will be a later redevelopment of some road network. Is that right? Yes, so um, whilst there's been approved plans as part of the previous planning permission, it's important to understand that that planning permission would still be an extant planning permission. Any new planning permission in principle, which would, which uh, if this recommended, if this application was approved today, there would still be the requirement to submit all of the detailed matters as part of an application and it would actually be open to a developer to submit different plans um, with than what was previously approved. Thanks Andrew. Uh, Councillor Driver. Yeah, th thanks Andrew for that, that um, bit of uh, understanding, um, easier understanding for, 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 for members. I think obviously this was part of a, a long running um, application which had the community in sometimes up in arms about uh, that type of thing. There was originally a master plan supposed to be taking place. Uh, I believe that now has to change. Does that mean that any future application, whether it be planning in principle or whatever, has to come back to planning committee? 
Andrew? Yes, so there was a master plan submitted as part of the um, previous application, um, although it ran alongside the approved, the actual consideration of the detailed matters. Um, there is still going to be a requirement or a condition recommended as part of any approval of this application for a master plan to be submitted. And again, that's open to a developer to either submit the same master plan or a different master plan. But um, the previous application had to come to committee, particularly because of the number of objections. And I suspect that given the scale and the size of the application, that we would refer it back to committee as well, given the given the public interest that it has um, with this development. Thanks, Andrew. Actually, you want to yeah, come back? Yeah, th 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 thanks for that, Andrew. I'm, I'm just I'm just looking at the, the report itself, and the applicant is Great Gretna Holdings Limited, and I, I believe the last time it was here, it was Alba. Um, I, I don't know if that that's that's a new applicant or they've changed names or whatever. Um, my understanding is they are not a developer as such, um, <clears throat> and this this sort of stinks of trying to make as much profit as possible before they sell it on. Um, so I've got real concerns about this one, uh, Chair. But if, if Andrew would ask the question about the applicant, answer the question about the applicant. So the question is whether or not the applicant's the same and changed name or another applicant, Andrew. I can answer that because I know it is the same thing. It it that is correct, but I think the address is still the same. Um, I mean. And the applicant was different for the planning permission in principle initially anyway, and um, I can quickly check. It was Alba developments for the approval of matters specified in conditions application last year. Um, the previous applicant for the planning permission in principle, um, if you just bear with me, I, I can tell you in a second when my system loads up. Um, So the actual applicant for the 2015 reference number was Green Bank Limited, and then it was Alba Group for the um, approval of matters specified in conditions um, with an address that I think for memory was in Guernsey. Sorry, I'm just again waiting for the for the system to load. Yes, oh. so the applicant details on the approval of matters specified in conditions was Alba Group, uh, building name Sovereign Trust, and it was in Guernsey. And the applicant for this um, application is. Oh, it's in the front of the paper, Andrew. Great and holdings. Yeah, I'm just checking. I just want to check the address uh, just to fully. I think we'll fully answer the question. So I think it's a it's a name change. Yes, Great and Holdings Limited, but the address is exactly the same as as the um, previous Alba Group. Of course, as long as the, as long as the application is legitimate, it will not really mm -hmm. affect our decision making process who the applicant is. But it's certainly a, a given Councillor Driver a food for thought. Any other questions for our case officer? Councillor Marshall, is that for the last time or are you looking to speak now? Looking to speak now, Chair. Bang on, Sean. <laughs> Andrew, um, I can remember a similar kind of master plan that was developed in Annan, and um, one of the, the conditions was similar to what we have here is that, you know, that the main road, which was Windermere Road at the time, was actually upgraded to a quality that could serve um, the full master plan at the beginning. Uh, I've got I've got concerns about this one because um, used to be a councillor that, that was responsible for Lowenworth Road, and it has always been an issue with regards to the traffic that's generated a lot on that route and I'm just wondering if we how many houses are we expecting to actually allow in in the various phases before the improvement works to Lomworth Road uh, will be done because my concern is I don't think there's any restriction 
for them to use the access that would take them up to the B721, although the preferred route would be along uh, the other part of Lomoth Road, which is a better, better state of road. So if you just maybe just clarify that, please. Andrew? Yeah, so initially the, the access proposed for this development is actually from Annan Road. It probably might be worthwhile going back to the phasing plan that is the fourth slide in. That's the one, yeah. So um, the initial phase of the development actually to be accessed from Annan Road, of which there would be two access accesses formed. The first one, um, there would be two accesses formed there and... Uh, um, over time, that would be two access points for the development, but through the construction period, one would be for construction access and the other would be to serve the residential development. So the the requirement to actually use Lomoth Road wouldn't be until the business units are to be developed, which has been stated as subject to demand, or when um, we hit 100 houses, which is when an emergency vehicle access would be required. So effectively, the trigger point will be 100 houses before works would start to be required on that road to serve this particular development. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Sean. OK, uh, if there are no other questions for our case officer, there are no registered speakers, so we're in session, members. Councillor Drybra. To say that I'm not happy about this one, Chair, is an understatement, but it's planning, it's planning we're actually dealing with here, um, and the situation is is that there is going to be a path eventually going on under. I'm not, I'm not happy with the, the applicant coming forward with this so soon after getting the, the, the planning application through last year um, in this particular thing. I know that I'm going to get um, you know, issues from constituents on, on this particular thing. What I want to make clear is, is that path or the widening of the road, part of the conditions that has to happen when that particular phasing happens within, within the, the, the old golf course setup. Is there going to be road widening? Is there going to, and the, reason, the reason I'm asking here is that particular route from Rig, which is just before Gretna, down to uh, the bottom end of Gretna, up Lonemouth Road, is actually quite a, a well-used path for people. And, and you know, safety-wise, I'd be concerned once the houses and all that sort of stuff um, were in place and that path wasn't, I would be really concerned for the safety of, of residents within that particular thing. I'm not going to go against the recommendations because it is in front of us as it is, but I just wanted to make sure that as part of the recommendations, there will be a phasing of making sure that that road widening or path is actually in place. I would presume that given that we will be granting a new application that if something were not unreasonable, we might be able to apply another condition anyway. But I'll ask David to help with that. Thank you, Chair. i uh, really just draw members' attention to page 75, which is the, the recommended conditions that you've got. Uh, goes over to page 76 as well. So you've got a reworded condition 5 there. So that makes it clear that thereafter there should be no occupation of any business unit or the identified residential fees for carrying out the works, etc., etc. So that is the proposed wording. That ties into the amended wording in condition 1H further up the page. So really what that's doing is, um, and I think I'm quite happy to commit to bringing any future application for the approval of matters back to condition, back to committee. So you're retaining control of that. That is effectively requiring the developer to demonstrate exactly the phasing that's proposed. And that will give you the opportunity to make sure that it happens. But what is absolutely clear is there is no pulling back of the need for the widening of Lonewith Road. It's just exactly when it's done. Uh, I'm happy if members are content to have reserved matters brought back to this committee if there's public concern about it in the local the local community and local area. Councillor Driver? Yeah, I, I agree with that, Chair. I fully, fully support that, that suggestion, um, in, in which case, you know, we'd go to the recommendations on this particular thing with that added condition that any future application or whatever will come, come back to this uh, committee. Content with that, David? Mm -hmm. OK, Tracy, can you just confirm the decision plus the, the, the additional uh, requirement, please? 
next year. Members have <coughs> approved application A, subject to the successful completion of the appropriate legal agree agreements within six months of the date of the decision or any extended time scale as agreed by the appointed officer and the conditions detailed in the report, with an additional recommendation to agree that any applications relating to this site are brought back to the Plan Applications Committee for consideration. Many thanks, Tracy. We move on to agenda item number eight, an application for residential and business units development without compliance with condition one of approval of matters specified in conditions consent 20 stroke 18, 18 stroke ARC relating to requirements in respect of pedestrian forward slash cycle access from Dominion Road, section 42 at former golf course Annan Road. Gretna. Application type section 42, reference number 22 stroke 0175 stroke S42. Recommendation is to approve subject conditions and case officer is Andrew Robinson. Andrew, again, can you just in layman terms for members lay out what is being requested here, why and what your recommendation is? Yes. Chair. So this this up following on from um, what I've set out before, this application actually relates to the detailed approval of matters application that was considered at the Planning Applications Committee in September last year. And what um, the application included was uh, a number of conditions um, for the for the development to adhere to, and one of those was requiring provision for a foot cycleway and footway link for, um, from Dominion Road, which is situated to the east of the site, um, to the application site to improve connectivity. So what the application is seeking is the removal of that condition, which I, I'll explain further in a, mo in a, in a moment. So uh, moving on to the next slide. Presentation. Yeah, so this is the location plan which I showed before. Um, uh, moving on to the next slide um, is the area view, and the and the area that we're considered we're considering here is in the eastern part of the site between the uh, southeastern corner and Dominion Road. And moving on to the next slide, this shows the proposed site layout that was approved last year, and the southeastern corner of the site. Um, there's a requirement in the site allocation in the development plan for a footway and cycleway link from Dominion Road to be um, developed to connect to the site. And the reason for that is to increase um, um, permeability from the site to the centre of Gretna and also to allow for direct walking distance so that people residing in those in that phase of the development have got easier access to the centre of Gretna because there, there is no other connectivity there and particularly because um, affordable housing was proposed in that phase as well and if we move on to the next slide this shows a zoomed in view of the plan and you can see in the plan it, it recognises cycleway connection but subject to third party agreement so it's not within the red line boundary of the site um, and it's a, and it was within third party ownership and moving on to the next slide the phasing plan identified this to be um, delivered in phase three so moving on to the next slide i'll show you the photographs of the area in question so this is the area to the rear of the social club and it's looking northeast so the houses in the um in the background is is annam road which is um which is uh, close to the center of gretna and moving on to the next slide this is the area of land between the social club and the rear of the of raydale park uh, the old football ground moving on to the next slide this is actually looking towards the site from from the area where it's hoped that a link would be formed and moving on to the next slide this shows the um, area between the two sites effectively where there is a burn that connects that's there between the two sites and moving on to the final photograph is looking northeast again and um, towards Annan Road so moving on to the next slide um, in summary um, the condition that was attached 
which was to effectively ensure that this um, link was delivered. And it was attached for very good planning reasons to request it. However, the applicant has challenged this on the grounds that they did not consider that the condition was appropriate to attach to a application for approval of matters specified in condition. The reason being that this is not an actual application for planning permission, and their view was that this should have been attached to the planning permission in principle application when it was considered in 2016. And following advice from legal services, they have um, agreed with the applicant that it wasn't appropriate to attach to this condition, to this particular application. So despite the good and clear planning reasons for it, and that such a link would be in accordance with the development and plan. The application has had to be recommended for approval um, following the advice of legal services and accept that that condition should be deleted from the previous approval. And that uh, concludes my presentation, but happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Andrew. Questions for Case Officer Archie? <coughs> Th thanks, Andrew, again for this. Again, looking at the applicant, Alba Group, yeah, here we go again. So you just wonder where these folk actually comfy and, and, and why they're putting these applications in. That, that site in Radial is owned by Radial Community Partnership, and some of you may remember Craig Peacock as a councillor who is the Radial Community Partnership chair. Um, I don't believe that the, the developer has had any discussion because Radial Community Partnership, being a community group, would have allowed a path through there without too much hindrance. And I don't think this, this organisation has actually discussed anything with them. They're certainly not, they just certainly didn't want to talk to any of the um, constituents in, in, in Gretna. We have to listen to legal argument here, Chair, um, at, at the end of the day. However, I'm not happy with this, 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 this group at all with these applications coming forward. It was a condition back in 2016. There was no discussion with RCP. It was, uh, th that's a community-owned piece of land. It's going to support people coming forward, do, walking and cycling to the school, not that far off, and getting to the shops and things like that. So I'm not going to go against legal advice, but... You know, I don't know, Andrew, if, you, if you're aware if this group has actually spoke to Radio Community Partnership or not. Andrew, I suppose just as a question that will help Councillor Driver, I've been discussing matters with constituents, whether or not there's been any communication between the applicant now and Radio Community Partnership. Not that I'm aware of. I remember being in um, a meeting with the applicant um, about a year and a half ago where this link was discussed and it was clearly advised by officers that they should work with the landowner to see whether this link could be delivered for the clear reasons for it. Um, the last word that we had was that they would try and work with the landowner, but we've never had any further update on that. So from what I gather is is I don't it doesn't sound like there has been. Thanks, Andrew. And I suppose Councillor Driver's view is a pragmatic one. We have to we are where we are. It's a shame the condition had been placed at the time the permission was granted, which would have tied it down, but it's too late now the horse has bolted, so to speak. Hey, Councillor Thompson. Uh, thanks, Chair. I just um, on the legal advice and the fact that I, I suppose we'd have been, it's just about looking closer at home sometimes to prevent future issues. Um, if legal advice is suggesting that actually the best time to put these types of conditions in is in the planning permission and principle phase, is that something that uh, is a general learning point within the team? Um, because obviously we wouldn't want to be vulnerable to things that are quite reasonable in planning terms now, but actually could be challenged. And in this case, clearly we're 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 bending to yield to that, um, given legal advice. So is that something that we can take on board to make sure we're uh, better equipped going forward in future? I would imagine the team does. I'm sure there's been an oversight in this case, David. Uh, no. Chair, it wasn't an oversight. It was simply the fact that by the time... The, you've got to remember that the original application was actually considered under Local Development Plan 1, which didn't have very much detail in it for this particular site. By the time Local Development Plan 2 came along, you had much more detailed 
uh, guidance for that specific site, including the, the various connections that we've talked about today. So that was the difference. That was the rationale behind why we felt it was appropriate to attach that condition. Um, obviously, now we do have legal advice at committee as well. Um, so certainly we've had a lot of discussions. Uh, if members would find it useful, I, I know Jackie Holland was um, standing in for Laura today who was at a public inquiry. So if, if you need to hear any legal advice, I'm sure that would be uh, quite possible today. But there was a rationale why this condition was attached when it was because of the change in the local development plan. Uh, I totally agree with Andrew. I'm reluctant to remove it for the reasons set out, but we do have to accept that there are very good reasons why legally we probably do have to agree to that. Remember, we're still at questions for a case officer because there's an objector's representation to be heard. Councillor Dreiber? It's a, a, a bit like Councillor Brett earlier on, you know, if, uh, <clears throat> this started with Green Bank Isle of Man, if you remember, and Green Bank Isle of Man actually got the radio community site as part of the deal when Gretna FC went into administration. So it was actually one piece of land that Isle of Man, or Green Bank Isle of Man actually came forward with the, the plan, so it was their site originally, but because of what happened with things in the community, we managed to get that part of the land owned by Green Bank back into uh, community ownership as well, so that was another part of the history to you. Big, big history. Thanks, Archie. Okay, so if there are no... Councillor Marshall, Sean. Yeah, thank you. It was just to, to ask Andrew that obviously the, this would have been a vital uh, connection, this cycleway foot, foot way to connect all the kind of aspects or parts of the the master plan going forward in all different phases. So obviously this this sounds as though this will be closed off now. This is not an option, which means that when we do get the full plan applications coming through for the various phases, that will have to probably change now because all the kind of pedestrian uh, footfall and um, you know cycling will have to utilise the existing network that's in place, whereas I would imagine that, you know, although it's a small part, this was the connecting link to the overall uh, development that, you know, that is down there. So uh, I'm just just wanting to seek clarity that that means that probably it will change the future plan applications coming in for the different phases of this overall master plan development. I take it this and I'll come back to committee as well, but David, maybe you help them rather than Andrew? Sorry, sir, I was hoping Andrew, having the greater knowledge of the history, oh, might when be able you to go in, Andrew, you're the man. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, we've, um, there wouldn't be any requirement for any further full planning applications to be submitted for this. The, the detailed matters have been approved as part of this application, um, of, the, of the application in September 2021. That, that that is the the scheme. There's no actual requirement for any further planning applications in respect of this permission, because this obviously ties in with the previous planning permission in principle. This application that's before you, um, so the detailed matters have already been approved. So if this application is to be implemented, then um, it, it can be implemented in accordance with the details that have been, that have been approved. Obviously, the item before will require future applications to be submitted. So it's up to the developer which application they want to implement going forward. If, if there's two applications extant for the site, but under this particular application you're considering at the minute, which links with the previous planning permission in principle that was approved, uh, was considered in 2016, it wasn't approved until 2018, then that site plan that I showed you um, earlier on in the presentation is the approved site plan. But um, there is a requirement for further applications to come back as part of the application that you approved in the previous item. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Happy with that, Sean? Yes, thanks, Chair. Thanks very much, Sean. If there are no other questions for the case officer, we have a representation now from 
Beverly Ann Robinson, object, uh, and it's a statement to be read out by Tracy. Thanks, Chair. Yes, he said, objector Beverly Ann Robinson's statement. My objections to the above planning application have been made by me before and my views have not altered. However, it would appear that you, the committee, have not taken into account any latest information regarding the state of the water and lack of it in Gretna. There is to be a period of cleansing the pipes commencing the 4th of July between 2200 hours and 0600 hours Monday to Thursday for approximately two weeks. This is because our drinking water is so full of rust from ancient pipes. On top of that, the water in Mallor Park has to be drained and cleaned every six weeks. This means the main valve in the road, both top and bottom, have to run at full pressure for more than 40 minutes. What a waste. There is also insufficient pressure, as it is in Gretna, without having 200 more homes tagged onto it. I also notice in the Annandale Observer on Friday the 17th of June 2022, the front page is given over to the worst value region. No surprise for those of us who live here that it is in Dumfries and Galloway. You are doing nothing to help our district of Gretna by allowing this planning of 200 homes and business units to go ahead, and you are only making matters worse for us mere ratepayers and the people you are supposed to be representing, not people who are dis disinterested in anything else other than their pockets and wealth. And do the honourable thing and put us first and disallow this planning application in full. Thanks, Tracy. No discussion on that because it's a, a representation. So, members, we're now in session. If there are no proposals being brought forward, I take it that there will be unanimous agreement to the decision by the, or recommendation by the case officer to approve this application as subject condition. Okay, Keith Walters, Keith, please. Sorry, I just wanted to clarify the, 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 the thing about the legal advice. Did the legal advice say that we could never add this condition, or was it that the fact that it was added at the wrong time or the wrong part of the planning? I think what David said was when the planning permission was granted initially, it was granted with what they call a local development plan, and we've subsequently developed a, 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 a region-wide plan that includes conditions or, or advice that wasn't at hand in, when the permission was first granted. Therefore, we'll never be able to add it now. But I'll ask David just to clarify for you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Now, it was more to do with the, the type of application that the planning permission in principle was considered under the previous local development plan. And where you've got a planning permission in principle, that's where you that's your only opportunity to attach onerous conditions. And really what the the agent is saying here is that because we attach this to the, the AMSIC, the approval of matters specified by conditions, that technically is not a planning application and therefore we should not have attached something of this onerous nature to that application, it should have been attached earlier, and it wasn't. So whilst things had moved on, we now had justification, we felt, to attach a condition because of the change in the local development plan. What they were saying is technically we shouldn't have done that to that type of application that was submitted, and following legal advice, we have to agree that we were probably pushing the envelope for the right reasons, but too far, which is why we're suggesting now that really we have no alternative other than to, to approve the application that's before you. Happy with that, Keith? I, I understand that. I'm not sure the answer to the question is, would we be able to um, put forward a, a similar condition to, a, to any of the next stages of this, which is obviously going to be a long-running development? Is that, is that it? We're not going to be able to, to, to put that, what you've described as an onerous Hang um, on to it. I think the answer will be no, but David? You, you certainly couldn't attach a similar condition to any future application which comes in for the approval of matters specified. Um, so, yeah, basically no. And that, that applies to not just this site, but to any application. You really cannot attach onerous requirements to what really should just be the, the meat on the bones, if you like, it's the details. You, you get the one chance for the planning permission principle to attach all your, your 
big requirements and after that it can only really be making minor changes to the very details that you've got. <coughs> okay, Keith. Yes, thanks. Thanks for that. Sorry. I, I see our legal advisor, Jack, Jackie Holland, wanting to come in. Hey, Jackie, if you want to come in, please. You're muted as well, Jackie. I do apologise. Just to clarify, what David has said is absolutely correct, unless there's a material change. So if there was a material change that changed the whole nature of the application in that event, the council may be in a position to uh, impose a change along the lines that we're discussing today. Uh, very well, uh, that muddies the water a bit, but um, by, by a significant change, you mean the, the plan being completely altered and brought back in a different fashion? Is that what you're telling us? Yes, that's correct. If it was deemed to be a material change, and you would have to address that at the time, so I couldn't speculate now. I just want to make it clear it's not totally ruled out. It does depend on what the nature of the uh, new application is. Thanks for that. But in the meantime, we are where we are. We have professional advice and from Jackie or, or, or our legal department. And the recommendation is that we go with the officer's recommendation to approve subject to conditions. So unless of any move to the contrary, that will be the decision of this committee. Confirm the decision, Tracy, please. Next year, members have agreed to approve the application subject to the conditions in the report. Thanks, members, and thanks for your attendance and indulgence today. I look forward to seeing you next month. I have no further business. Thank you, members.